Hello, my name is Fielden Allison, and I'm here with my wife, Janet. We have lived in Africa since 1972, and we work with marriages, in counseling and teaching seminars all over the continent. We have five children and 22 grandchildren. I have a master's degree in Bible. My wife has a master's degree in marriage and family therapy. We have a real heart for teaching on the subject of marriage and family. We've been doing it since 1984 when we taught our first weekend seminar with four couples in Kenya. We've seen so many families in churches and in communities divided because of marital issues. We've even seen leaders who commit adultery and abandon their families. These sorts of things happen over and over again. Unfortunately, in our years here on the African continent, we've seen that divorce has become more and more common. And it isn't just the men who are divorcing their wives these days. As they've become more educationally and economically empowered, the women are no longer willing to meekly submit to abusive behavior from their husbands, and they are quite often seeking divorce themselves. This is becoming such a social as well as a spiritual issue that it needs to be addressed. Our question for this session is, if my spouse and I disagree often on important issues, have I married the wrong person? That's a very interesting question. To ask that question means that one assumes or believes that God has a specific plan for a person to marry one specific person. Mm -hmm. We can look at a story in the Bible to see that God definitely cares whom we marry and that he will help us to make a good choice. We can read about Abraham and the process that he went through to make a choice for a wife for his son Isaac in Genesis chapter 24. We can first of all see that the father is the one responsible for finding a wife for his son. I know that in former times, this was also the practice in Africa. However, these days, young people want to make choices for themselves, but they often don't have the experience to make a wise choice. Even if they look for their own spouse, young people should involve their parents to make sure that they are in agreement with their choice. Yes, parents still have a big role to play in the selection of mates for their children. Even if the children want to choose for themselves, the parents need to talk to their children before they even begin searching for a mate about how to make a wise choice, mm -hmm. what to look for. But foremost is prayer. Mm -hmm. What we see in this account in Genesis 24 is that it was actually God who made the choice for Isaac's wife. Let's read verse 3 and 4 and verse 7. There Abraham tells his servant, I will make you swear by Jehovah, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you shall go into my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. Verse 7, he continues, saying, Jehovah, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my nativity, and who spoke to me and who swore to me, saying, Unto your seed will I give this land. He will send his angels before you, and you shall take a wife for my son there. First, we see that Abraham sends his wise, trusted servant to go back to his home or parental country to seek a wife. We also see that Abraham had complete trust in God to lead his servant mm -hmm. to the very right one. Yes, uh, I think it's interesting that Abraham did not want his son to marry a Canaanite, a young woman from among the people among whom they lived, from among their neighbors. Why would this be? Did he not want one of the girls that they were familiar with? Some people think that when they want to choose a spouse, that they shouldn't choose someone close, that they need to look for a stranger. Is that what Abraham is telling us? Well, I hope not. That would mean that you and I married the wrong person. <laughs> we had known each other and gone to school with each other from grade five of primary school. We were classmates all the way through our high school and college and knew each other very well. I saw you nearly every day from the time you were 10 years old. <laughs> Actually, marrying someone you've known for a long time is a good thing. 
because you know their character, you know their family, and the way they behave in many different situations. The more you know about someone, the better chance you'll have of making the relationship work. If you know the story of Abraham, you'll remember that God called him to leave the land of his father to go to a new land, a land that he would give to his descendants, the land of Canaan. He journeyed for many months to this new land, a place filled with pagans, people who did not believe in the one true God. Abraham sent his servant back to the land of his father, a land of believers in the true God. That teaches us a very important point when it comes to choosing a spouse. The person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with, choose a believer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, we have a very important principle. Be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship have righteousness and iniquity? Or what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion has a believer with an unbeliever? If you're a Christian, then you need to marry a Christian. Mm -hmm. Making a marriage work is difficult even at its best. Being yoked with an unbeliever would put one at a definite disadvantage. In answering the question, did I marry the wrong person? We're focusing, first of all, on how to make a good choice to begin with. The first step is to search among believing friends who have a common faith. The chances of harmony are much greater if you have common basic beliefs. In fact, I would go so far as to say that you should choose someone of the same denomination as the one you're a member of. Mm -hmm. I've seen husbands mm -hmm. plagued by wives who were in different denominations from the ones they were members of. I had one friend who was a preacher for his particular church, but he married a wife from a different church. This wife would spread false rumors around the village about her husband, trying to nullify or to tear down his ministry in his church because she wanted him to go to her church. Mm -hmm. Learning to live together in peace as a husband and wife is difficult enough without adding the extra stress of being of different religious faiths. So let's get back to our story of Abraham choosing a wife for his son. Let's continue reading in Genesis 24, verses 10 through 12. It says, And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master, and departed, having all goodly things of his master's in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, unto the city of Nahor. And he made the camels to kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Jehovah, the God of my master Abraham, send me, I pray you, good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. We see here that the first thing the servant did upon arrival at Abraham's home country was to pray. Yes, I think our question, did I marry the wrong person, looks at the situation from the wrong end. We need to be asking, is this the right person or the wrong one for me before we get married? We need to be praying intensely long before getting intimately involved with a person. Pray about it before beginning to get serious. God will be with you. He wants to help you make a good choice, but you must be willing to listen. Yes, you know, often young people make their choice and then they ask God to give them the person they've chosen. This is putting the cart before the horse, or before the donkey, we might say. They often try to manipulate God into accepting the person they've already chosen. That's too late. And to ask, did I marry the wrong person, is not appropriate. Exactly. After you're married, it's too late to ask such a question. Marriage is a commitment you make for a lifetime. And once you've taken that step, there's no turning back. This person is now your husband or your wife. We see in this story that Abraham's servant asked for God's guidance before attempting to make a choice. I'd like for us to look closely at this man's prayer. Mm -hmm. He prayed in an unusual way in Genesis chapter 24, verses 13 and 14. There it says, Behold, 
I am standing by the fountain of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel, or girl, to whom I shall say, Let down your pitcher, I pray you, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I'll give your camels drink also. Let the same be she that you have appointed for your servant Isaac. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's interesting. We see here that the servant set up a sort of test to find a girl with good character. This is the time before one meets the girl to decide what is good character and what is not acceptable. The second step after prayer is to set criteria according to what one considers important. Then look at behavior to see if the candidate measures up. We can see in the servant's prayer that his criteria were a hard-working girl, a girl who is hospitable and friendly, and a girl who welcomes guests. What many young men set as their primary criteria is physical beauty. When they see a beautiful girl, they decide that this is the one I want to marry, and they forget to test her character. The young man may get a beautiful woman, but then, after they get married, he may find that she is very selfish and lazy, but now it's too late. There's a verse in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4 that I want to read. It says, Whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of braiding the hair and of wearing jewels of gold or of putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in the incorruptible apparel of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Mm -hmm. And many young women set as their primary criteria a man who is wealthy. A woman may indeed get a wealthy man, but he may be unfaithful, or he may be a drunkard, or he may not communicate with her, so she is miserable in her big, fancy house. Getting back to our story of Abraham and his servant, even before he finished his prayer, a girl named Rebecca appeared. She was coming to fetch water at the well where the servant was seated. The servant asked Rebecca for a drink, and she quickly drew water for him to drink. Then she volunteered to draw water for his ten camels. Camels are amazing beasts. They go many days without drinking anything, but then when they are finally given water, they can drink many gallons. So I think we can agree that Rebecca was a girl who was hardworking. You know, it's interesting that in verse 16, we're told that Rebecca was also a beautiful woman. However, the deciding factor was observation of her behavior, not her looks. It is also interesting that in that very same verse, it says that Rebecca was a virgin. That is a criteria that we need to come back to these days. A girl or a boy who has kept him or herself pure, especially in these times when sexual diseases are so prevalent. You are very right about that. That is a very important consideration. I pray that God bless you as you seek His will, as you make a choice for a spouse for yourself or for your child. Abraham insisted on going to a place where believers were found. Then we see that the first thing the servant did upon arrival was to pray. When we put God first, He blesses us. And if we are sincere in pursuing God's will, He will bless us with a good choice, just as He did for Abraham's servant. Remember that a beautiful spirit is far more important than physical beauty. Even a plain woman begins to look beautiful to us when we focus on her beautiful spirit. Let's look now at those who are married but find themselves quarreling often. Jesus had some words for those who are married in Matthew chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. There he said, For this cause a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And in verse 9, he adds, Whoever shall put away his wife except for fornication and shall marry another commits adultery. 
When two people are married, they have already made a choice. God has joined them as one. It is the right choice in light of the fact that the choice has already been made, whether in a good way or not, and the two of them are now one. Perhaps you didn't choose wisely at the time. You may have been focusing on physical beauty, or you didn't have full information on the person's background or the family. However, he or she is yours because you're now married. Your choice now is how to make the best of the situation. So many people give up and take the option of divorce too quickly. Jesus has told us what God has joined together, let no man separate. Your union as a husband and wife is a forever commitment. So many people don't realize that what it takes to make a marriage last is that sense of strong commitment. Mm -hmm. When you get married, you made certain vows to one another to stay together. You said, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. These days, many people live as if they've said, for better, but not for worse, for richer, but not for poorer, to stay together unless he or she gets sick. We find our commitments are conditional. Mm -hmm. Being married is much more than just falling in love. Marriage is a lifetime commitment that needs to be made over and over again. A long-term commitment takes hard work. So our question then becomes, how do we deal with a situation where we find a couple quarreling frequently? First of all, I'd like to say that how often a couple disagree is not the measure of whether they marry the right or the wrong person. All couples disagree at times. This is just normal behavior. I remember a couple who were from the United States and were living in Nairobi at the time. We were visiting Nairobi one time and were eating a meal in their home. The wife was busy in the kitchen, and the husband was talking to us in the sitting room. Yeah. While we were talking, this man made this statement. My wife and I have been married 20 years, and we've never had a quarrel. Wow. Do you remember that, Fielden? I remember so well. When, when the man left the room to go check on the food preparation, we looked at each other and we asked, wow, what's wrong with us? We've only been married for five years and we've quarreled so many times. However, soon after that conversation, that couple returned to the United States and within two years they were divorced. So it's obvious that even though they did not quarrel, there were some serious underlying problems that they did not address. Yes, in fact, we heard sometime later that at the very time we were visiting them in Nairobi, the husband was being unfaithful. He had many girlfriends. When one is married, he or she should not look at other women or other men. One should focus his or her attention on his or her spouse. He or she should find something good about his or her spouse. Every person has some good points, but we often choose to dwell on his or her bad traits. Everyone has some good characteristics and some bad characteristics. I heard on a program recently that every person has at least 10 good features and at least 10 bad features. Mm -hmm. Maybe everybody except me, right? We need to pinpoint those good features and concentrate on those. Perhaps it would be a good exercise to make a list of your spouse's 10 good traits and another list of, let's say, five bad characteristics. Look over the list of bad characteristics and forgive your spouse from your heart for those things. Then throw that list away or burn it. Then look at the good list every day and thank God for your spouse and even praise your mate for those good things. You know, it might be a good exercise also for one to make a list of his own 10 good traits mm -hmm. and 10 bad traits. Mm -hmm. Nobody is perfect. That helps to put things into perspective. As you look at your list of bad characteristics, try to change and do something from your good list instead. Do something that your spouse would never expect. If you do something new, then your spouse will also change because you have broken the cycle of interacting to each other. And then your spouse can't react to you in the same way 
because you've changed the pattern. You can change one small thing. Mm -hmm. Speak more gently. Compliment your spouse. Say something like, you did a great job on that. Tell your spouse, thank you for something he or she did. Give your spouse your full attention. Help take care of the children cheerfully. Mm -hmm. Do something totally unexpected, something you don't normally do. Surprise him or her and see what happens. That reminds me of a story I heard many years ago. There was a herbalist who had become a Christian. One day a woman came to her seeking medicine to make her husband love her, to stop beating her. He comes home every day and begins to quarrel with me until he gets so angry he beats me, she said. The wise herbalist went outside, pulled some grass, and told the woman, This is special grass. When you see your husband coming, put this grass between your teeth and bite it. If he begins yelling at you, bite on this grass. Don't take it out of your mouth or the medicine won't work. If he says something kind to you, then you can take the grass out and answer him. But as long as he's angry or quarrelsome, keep that medicine between your teeth and bite hard. The following week, the woman returned to the herbalist and said, That medicine really worked. My husband loves me now and speaks kindly to me. He doesn't beat me anymore. Of course, it wasn't the grass that brought about the change in her husband. It was the change he was seeing in his wife's behavior. When she kept her mouth shut, he reacted in a healthier manner. Men usually think the wife is the one that is bad and needs to change. However, husbands are also bad. They also need to change their behavior sometimes. I sometimes get in an irritable mood. And then I notice only your faults, and I begin to grumble or complain or to criticize. But I've noticed that when I change my attitude, I begin to notice the good things about you and leave the complaining. If you find that you are quarreling often, the answer is not to get divorced because you married the wrong person. The answer is to look at yourself. Are you being the right person? What can you change to make the situation better? This is your spouse, the one you pledge to stay with for the rest of your life. Remember your love in the beginning and make an attempt to revive that love. Don't change partners. Change your attitude or your behavior. This is a very important question. I hope that you've understood how important it is to preserve your own marriage. Don't look at someone else, but look at your spouse with new eyes. If you have any questions about this topic or any other topic related to marriage and the family, send us an email to aimfradio at gmail.com. Thank you for joining us today, and may God bless your marriage to stand firm. Thank you.